So good to see you, Michelle. It's so good to see you. I'm so I'm so happy to be here. I'm so glad that we get to kind of come together and talk about such a such a cool project we got to both be a part of, Karina and the King. Yeah, and and one that has had such a such an impact and reached such a large audience. It's amazing. I mean, I feel like we all love a little cheese man. Like, you know, sometimes we don't want to, like, deal with it in our real life, but it's, like, fun to be, like, that's why we love reality TV. And, you know, with this story, I was discovering the the details of it as we were recording um, because I wanted to be able to be surprised and kind of really be part of the the discovery of the details of it. And every single time I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> I don't understand how this is real life. Yeah. I get a, I mean, I concur with that because it's also the fact that we are both discovering um, aspects of this story. Did you know the story before? No, I know you had spent a little time in Spain, so um, that you well, know, you were aware. I knew. I only knew the fact that he had abdicated. I didn't know the details surrounding Corina Larson and all of the corruption behind the scenes. I didn't know anything at all, at all, at all. Um, I just knew, you know, when I was approached for this, I knew that it was about um, a mistress and yeah. the, the royal family. Um, I, I also, you know, I, I was very intrigued by a lot of like the themes and ideas that kind of came up, but, the, but as it kept going, and the story got wilder and crazier and just it, every episode I was just like, it can't get any more than this. And it, it can't. And, and, and yet being... it, does. <laughs> it really does. It's like the Spanish version of the crown. I mean, but, yeah, yeah. Um, but even crazier. No, totally. One thing that has been very shocking to me as we go, as you're saying, like as we are discovering the story ourselves as narrators, for me, it was... Um, King Juan Carlos and how multiple kind of personalities this very public figure has and how on that level of privilege uh, you just disconnect from reality in a way. You know, and I think one of the things that is such a credit to the way that Project Brazen put together the storyline um, was that how, you know, you really do also understand like that type of upbringing, it doesn't excuse it. Yeah. But how a lot of times, you know, if you knew someone's story from start to finish, you would almost be like, of course you end up that yeah. way. Or of course yeah. that's the way that your life is or your life views are. Um, so that I think was something that I, I really enjoyed was that there was really, True. Uh, nobody was really like the villain or the hero completely. It humanizes the whole thing for sure to understand the dysfunctionality of of the upbringing in those type of spaces for sure but i also think it's a great opportunity to question the existence of those um type of monarchies to this day before our eyes with the money of the people <laughs> you know 100 percent. and you know i think we're obviously living in a world where there is a lot of um like wealth gaps and divides and it's getting stronger and a lot of uh you know appearances uh you know as we saw with Juan Carlos it was this like, very much like this this feeling of the way that things appear and how the public was so willing to accept that um mm -hmm. and also how sometimes you know I think this was a thing someone isn't completely it's not like they're all bad like what he was able to do for Spain was huge compared True. to True. What was, where it was. It did uh, save democracy at one point from going back and, you and know, to times of Franco. And, exactly, and yeah. leading the steps to that direction. But yet, you know, he still is a product of his environment. And then, and then of course, we have uh, the story of Corina, which, um, you know, I, I was... God, I was just about to say I'm I was surprised, but I'm really not with how vilified she mm -hmm. was in that um, and how much of the weight of the him getting taken and falling from the throne that she carried in the press and in the That's media true. and in the court of public opinion. I, like I said, I was about to say, oh, it was so surprising, but unfortunately it really isn't. I think us as women... Uh, we really do carry a lot of of 
the burden, and yet somehow the man tends to literally get away with murder. I kind of like the 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 way that this particular podcast, you know, deals with that because first of all, even though it's from the perspective of Karina for the first time, actually, she was interviewed mm -hmm. for this, but it also is not liberating anybody. There's a lot of what we were just saying right now. It's a, a lot of the dysfunctionality of privilege. You can have your opinion about her, but it's also um, a disconnect from everybody in that story. <laughs> and that's um, something that I feel that the podcast keeps objectivity on. Also the, the perspective of toxic love, because this is told as a love yeah. story, which it is. I mean, they had a love story within within it all. I don't know if I can speak from personal things, mm -hmm. uh, really learning what love really is. Yes. And, uh, and realizing that, you know, so much of us, so many of us were raised, especially as women to be like, you want that like butterflies who can't stand to be around you, you know, be not be around <sighs> you, who's obsessed and you know, all that stuff. And then we're like, Oh, that's love. And then yes. you're just like, actually real love is pretty, boring and beautiful and peaceful. Peaceful. And I would call it peaceful. I like that idea. I always say to myself, love is peace. And this one in particular is the complete opposite of that. But there's also all the elements of he was married, you know, mm -hmm. Queen Sophia. And like you said before, it all fell on, on, on Karina. Like she destroyed that marriage. But what about his role in his own marriage? You know, Sophia's own role in her own happiness. You know, like all these things that that on those spaces are even hi more heightened because they have then to play a role or to play a part based on whatever the institution demands. They have masks, everybody. <laughs> There's nobody here that doesn't have a mask on. And I really enjoyed that about the podcast, the masks. Oh, I mean, mm -hmm. and we all learn to wear them in our lives because it's what allows us to survive and feel loved or appreciated or important. Something I've been thinking about too a lot recently is like, who are you? You can't say your job. You can't say your position on oh, so-and-so's daughter, I'm so-and-so's sister. It's like, who are you really? And I think that that's a question that the podcast begs over and over again. And I think this, this universe, what I say is like, it heightens what we already deal with in real life mm -hmm. or whatever circumstances. It's like heightened completely because yeah. I don't think that these people are living real lives. You know, they're, <laughs> they're in another universe type of thing. And you're like, it really? It really is. And, and showing... I mean, how many different versions of this world many of us live. I mean, I think, you know, some people are just trying to survive and put food on the table and, you know, other people are trying to survive and not get killed like Princess Diana. <laughs> and I think, I think for us also, those of us that aren't in that situation, it is always kind of like fun to peek our little heads into yeah. that part. All the other half lives, the 1% or like the 0.5%, I think at that point. You no, know, an another one of my favorite things about it is like, like you mentioned at the beginning, everybody wants to know a chisme, you know, everybody wants to know what the, the behind the scenes story of, and the fact is that we are hearing this quote unquote love story Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a fairy tale. It's the fairy tale. It's like really within the crown of Spain that it, all of yes. these palaces yes. that they're going through and these big dinners and servants and all of it, like a Disney um, story. And yet it's like the Brothers Grimm's version of the Disney story. This is uh, true. At the end of the day, it's a case of corruption mm -hmm. and really breaking a country's heart because... Juan Carlos and the crown was very beloved. You know, even something interesting with, with Karina is that she wasn't his only mistress, but yet she was oh. the one that was kind of burned <laughs> at the stake of public opinion. Uh, and her life was kind of torn apart. But yet, I mean, as it ends, she still hasn't fully walked away, which is interesting as well. She's still yeah. very much evolved a bit in in the um the web of Juan Carlos I understand like I appreciate the fact that that happens that, that this is told in a very objective perspective because to be honest like mm -hmm. you said before I don't think that there's like the heroine or the villain everybody is very much in a world that I don't 
recognize or connect with. Like, I don't feel um, that she should be the one vilified for whatever happened, but I also don't feel like, oh my God, I love her. And I think that the, this podcast does that. It gives them the same amount of either responsibility, but really he is the one who had the power. He is the one who was king. And that's where it really wasn't fair how, how the press treated her in terms of him. I, I think also uh, we're talking about the crown, but also, you know, yeah, it's like a Spanish version of like Harry and, and Meghan Markle, you know, like, yeah. what that, you know, and I think part of even with that, you know, I'm also like the, the royal families have for centuries, this is the way that things have been operated. They have no problem killing a wife to be able to remarry. And, you know, this whole world really is a world that we are not accustomed to. I actually have to think about it because we are, we're also talking from a perspective of a continent that doesn't have monarchies. But of course, for those countries that have it, like Spain and England, and they have, they have a connection to their kings and queens. They yeah. have um, that. Um, it's not necessarily that I understand it, but I guess because it's so in the fabric of, of culture, I, I mm. do understand that. So this must be very heartbreaking for someone who idolized the king for so long, you know, and have now has now yeah. to deal with the disenchantment. So in a way, based on how society acts in terms of, of course, they had to find a scapegoat. It couldn't be him. He couldn't have done all oh. of that. Of course not. <laughs> you know, not. one of my favorite parts, and not because it's like a big deal, it's just, again, gossipy, and you're like, oh my God, is the fact that they had created a WhatsApp group, like all of the King Juan Carlos with all of his, like her ex-husbands. And I'm yes. like, what? It's just so strange. It's all so surreal in this universe. Oh my God, can you imagine if all of your exes were on a WhatsApp group? Uh, what a nightmare. Oh my God. What is happening in this story? <laughs> it's, it's really funny at the end of the day, but it's kind of intertwined. Like the podcast is also bringing all of this reality about the corruption mm. and the money. This is something that, that um, the creators, Bradley Hope and Tom Wright, are really good at, that mm. I appreciate about their work, exposing case of, of corruption. But this one has been dealt in a way that is way more palatable, I guess. Yeah, you know, you're like listening to again the love story and whatever, and then wah, it comes and bites like, you. Beautiful narrator voices. <laughs> yes, yes, it's just indeed. Telling, telling it. Um, did you get Did you get any notes about how you should narrate this at all, or you just went with? I I got a little bit like I think part of it too. I wanted like to create a fun character mm -hmm. um, with this this narrator. I was like, I want it to be kind of like the the Kermit drinking the tea meme where it's like but that's yeah yeah, yeah. and, and I was you like, did so as as all roads lead to the Kermit meme drinking the tea your character the one you created to narrate this is very sassy and <laughs> like that like the the tea drinker but she's also like a little bit of a hint of gossiping you're gossiping like, with your audience kind of like you always know like the the tia or the titi that's like telling you what happened down the street <laughs> Or like, yeah. you know, it's like, but you know, I mean, that's none of my business. Yeah. But they're like, but, but he did show up at 2 a.m. You know, like yes. kind of that stuff. You know, I, I, mean, I you love how she, like, a language can change so much your choices because for me, do it in Spanish and knowing that this was being told as a fairy tale, I kind mm -hmm. of went with those um, Disney translations of back yes. in the day. There was also the combination of Desperate Housewives kind of narration. Mm -hmm. so I kind of married both. And I definitely, again, created this character that is very much more ethereal and, and literally telling a, a fairy tale that <laughs> goes and bites you. I did, um, I mean, I asked, can I have a point of view as a narrator? So like, absolutely. Many a times you can hear the narrators has a point of view about what's happened. Like, yeah. really? This, so the 65, los 65 millones de euros. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? That was one of my favorite things about uh, the experience as a narrator. It was to have yeah. that uh, freedom to play with it and, and go with the flow. And the fact that both languages are so fantastic and so different mm -hmm. in their approach. I love that because it's like each language narrated has its own personality, you know? 
And I appreciated that very much. No, it was was so much fun. It was so much fun. They didn't tell us, you have to sound the same. No, absolutely not. That was great. Yeah, no, and that was like, yeah, I think uh, Project Raisin, what they're doing uh, in the um, podcast space is just so wonderful. You know, we're getting new stories, but in a way that is, um, is just a bit more fun. Yeah, you know, almost in the way, like, I think like the way that, gonzo style of of journalism put yourself in it and now you know we're getting to kind of be part of uh, exploring a new way to tell uh these stories that um you know feel like they could be written but instead it is truth um, it is true it's that's true that's it doesn't it. sound like a non-fiction no. and yet it is <laughs> yeah, sadly exactly. <laughs> exactly. i think it's i think it's both um fascinating and fun. I mean, it's been very well received and I know I get a lot of comments. I, I can't wait for the next episode because it does feel a little bit addictive like that. I know when I was narrating, I wanted to know what was next. I would like wait for the scripts. I didn't want to go on Wikipedia and see how things would end yeah, no. or, you know, all that stuff. Cause I was like, Ooh, I want to like still be in that fresh that fresh shock. <laughs> this was so much fun. And I appreciate so much that these two Latinas are telling this very uh, Spanish story. So again, it's like from a very it's outsider perspective, just like the podcast was written by people who are not from Spain. And, and that makes it more of a, well, there, nobody has any interest here to protect anyone. This is just as it is. And we're just say, telling you a story. I'm so happy we got to do this together. And I'm so glad that we got to kind of connect and, and debrief. Yeah. I'm like, was yes. it as crazy for you as it was for me? Because the story yes. was nuts. Yeah, 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 for sure. I, I do I appreciate it very much. <laughs> Thank you, Project Brazen, La Coctelera Music, PRX, for this great, great podcast.